morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to Low Season Africa. Uh, this is the final episode in our mini-series, and I know that many of you will have joined us for all of the episodes that we've had so far, um, all over Southern and Eastern Africa. Um, what we wanted to do for this last episode um, is to, to do the final frontiers. So this is, well, the final frontiers or the next frontiers is, is probably more uh, appropriate, I'm sure Warren would, would agree. Um, what we wanted to do is talk about the destinations in Africa from a wildlife perspective that are the next destinations that we're going to be looking at for the future. So these destinations are not as well established, um, anywhere near as well established as um, some of the other destinations that we've gone through in this series, um, but they've got an awful lot to offer nevertheless. Um, so really looking forward to this final episode. I can't believe we've come to the end already, um, but I hope you've um, you've enjoyed it all with us. But let's um, let's get straight on. As always, um, got to say huge thanks to uh, the team at Africa Rome, uh, without whom we we wouldn't quite simply wouldn't be able to do this whole series. Um, Africa Rome is a renowned African tour operator, offering travelers access to some of the continent's most exclusive and unique experiences, from unattainable culinary opportunities to behind the scenes access to art and culture, adrenaline based adventures, access to the top safari guides, and the majesty of the natural wonders. The team at Africa Rome tailors every trip to exceed their guests' requests. Um, and if you'd like any further information on Africa Rome, I would encourage you all, please, to uh, visit the website, africarome.com. Um, and of course, you can contact uh, Rue or any of the team at Africa Rome on the email addresses there. Um, so without further ado, we should also uh, introduce you to, um, I'm sure many of you know him already, uh, Warren Pearson, who we're delighted to have with us um, again. Um, Warren is a specialist naturalist guide, he's an explorer, a photographer, and he's just an all-round an all nice guy. Uh, we absolutely love Warren and we've had so much positive feedback since we've done this series. Um, it's, a, it's a real privilege to, uh, to have him with us. So let's, uh, let's bring in Warren now. <coughs> um, are you there, Warren? There you are. How are Hi, you? Hi, Jade. How are you doing? I'm very well and you. Thank you. I'm very good and I can, and I can hear you as well, which is, which is great. Um, yeah, just again for the for the, for the for the for the for the viewers' point of view and the listeners' point of view, um, you you got a bit of a storm going on there, right? Yeah, well, we just had a power outage, um, so the whole area is down, and uh, I had to quickly move down to to another venue. So, hence the the different background. Um, yeah. We're running on a generator power at the moment, so if I do lose you, um, I'll re kink in when 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 the power comes back on. But um, for the moment, yeah, just uh, I'm glad to be on. Yeah, well, great, great to have you. Great you're to have looking, you again. You're with looking that. quite warm yourself there. Yeah, um, you know what? You know, we've we've been doing these for God, how many weeks have we been doing them, Warren? And I've always been sat down <laughs> in my shirt, and you've been the one wrapped up warm. Uh, and here am I in my in my new birthday hoodie, <laughs> desperately trying to keep warm because it's it's getting decidedly autumnal here in Manchester right now. I can tell you, I had to de yeah, the car yesterday morning for the first time uh, this year, which is never a good sign. I know we uh, we're looking forward to a nice sort of uh, summer soon approaching us. It's a little bit chilly here, but um, Northern Hemisphere I know is is getting a little bit chilly right now. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so hey, I can't believe it's the it's the last episode. Um, it's it's um, gone past so quickly. It really has, hasn't it? Well, I mean, we we must have started these. I guess we must have started them in July. I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of losing track. Um, I was thinking back to when we when we started them, and I I can't really remember. But um, I know it's it's. Uh, well, I think it's the last one on Africa mini series, but hopefully there'll be a few more. There'll, def there'll definitely be a lot more. Um, but you know, I suppose that's a, a good sort of point to to talk through what we're going to be talking about today um, and why it's the final frontiers. Is it? Is it am I right? It, we probably should have made this the next frontiers, shouldn't we? I think I originally called it the final frontiers, and that's probably a misnomer. Yeah, the, I mean, the areas we're going to be talking about are, are areas I feel have a lot of potential. Um, in the future and some of the places you can visit immediately I mean they're, they're open for tourism some of them are not open for tourism um, mm. but you know if you have to ask me that in maybe a year or two years time they might be open for tourism so they're at that point of of uh, really coming to the fore and um, you know it's it's kind of they're really exciting places and they offer 
something completely different to your average safari, which you'll find in Southern Africa or in East Africa. Um, and I just think it's, it's, it's places that, you know, I want people to know about. And this is low season traveler, but you know, these, these places, some of them only have one season um yeah. and it's it's going to be low season time for them you know not many people want to go there and uh we'll cover why people don't want to go there there's a lot of sort of there has been a lot of turmoil in the past um, a mm -hmm. lot of conflict um but these places are are coming sort of rising out of the ashes so to say and um you know i'm i've been to some of them i haven't been to all of them i'll, mm -hmm. I'll openly say um but you know just they are some spectacular properties and areas. And we, we're not focusing specifically on countries this time. We actually are going to be focusing on uh, actual reserves or parks. Yeah. And that's, that's, so we're going to be jumping around a bit about the countries. And I think you've got the maps already to where we're going to be going. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this. And I, I want people to, to understand and to, to get to know these places and, and hopefully be able to support them in the future from a tourism perspective. Yeah, and and these kind of destinations, like you say, we'll we'll sort of start with them shortly. But these destinations, these are, in in my opinion, very sort of different destinations from an African point of view. These these aren't the ones which, which I see in any brochures or on the internet or or anything else. These ones are, you know, they they really are. Um, I suppose in many ways they're in their infancy from a tourism perspective. But there are always travellers, and I know that a lot of the low season traveller audience fit into this category. People that want to travel to the next destination before it gets too big yeah. you know we touched on this i think last week with um you know botswana and madagascar or the week before rather um and i think it's it's it seems that each of these destinations is a little bit like that this is you know they're at the early stages and you need to understand that they're not the finished article in in that regard um however you know, if you want to go before the rest of the world goes, um, it's it's a great time to start thinking about trying these places, right? Exactly. And, you know, these, and I just want to let everyone know that's, that's listening and watching this, is that these are places that you've got to have a quite a big adventurous spirit to want to go and visit them. But I think you also want to have, um, you want to know that you are helping and contributing to one conservation yeah. Um, and to to the local communities that are, are surrounding these parks. And, you know, we're going to cover a bit of that today. I'm going to go over some of the, the community development aspects that's happening around these parks, which has helped bring these parks um, out of where they've been in the past. You know, and you need the community to support you um, mm -hmm. in conserving this. So, you know, this is for someone that really wants to get involved in a conservation side of things, into a community development side of it, a cultural side. Um, it's not just about going and photographing big animals. Um, it's it's more of a actual wilderness wildlife adventure. And um, I I've been as I said I've been to a few of these places, and uh, people that I've taken there have their eyes are just I mean it's it's just it's like a kid at Christmas time. You know, yeah. it's just they are one of the first people to go there. There's not many people that have been to these areas, and it's 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 an exciting venture. It's an exciting opportunity for most people to go and visit yeah it's it sounds it as well you know like i said i was looking at the photographs that we we're putting we were putting up and putting together for, for this episode and i was yeah i was kind of getting goosebumps thinking god I would, this is this is well, adventure this is adventure I, I think a lot of these places as you say you know you, you google them you won't find them <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Um, you know the marketing material hasn't been put out for them so uh, a, it's a really good point there's uh, there's been a few actually on this on this journey that we've done where you know I'm, I we, you know we use Shutterstock and we mm -hmm. pay handsomely for the for the privilege of using Shutterstock <laughs> and there's been a few of the parks that you've brought up and Shutterstock's come up with a blank and that even gets me excited that yeah. that makes me think okay Shutterstock's coming up with a blank there's not a huge amount on Google either this this tells me this is adventure this is this is what travel's all about um, I love that's, it and that's and that's what it should be about that's what I'm about that's what I love and this yeah. is why I love you know working with with Low Season Traveler on this is that. You know, it's 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 the audience. I feel is is an adventurous audience, and yeah. you know they want to find these kind of places. And you know, I have a little saying that that I sort of live by, and that's sort of you know, where I go, you can't Google. Um, yeah. You know, most most itineraries and stuff on the website, you can Google them and find out where you're going. But you know, I like to put trips together where you can't Google and you can't yeah. find out about them. So uh, yeah, it's those kind of places that really get me excited. I love it. I love it. Just one one last one. Um, over the weekend, my sister actually. Uh, was shared with me a, qu a quote which I just love as well. 
for for the exactly the reasons that we're saying and i thought it was quite appropriate but it was that uh, history history wasn't made by those who follow the recipes and i thought that's, that's exactly. exactly it it's it's about doing something doing something different and those are the people that make their mark on this yeah. world they they do something yeah. different listen exactly. let's 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 crack straight into it um so, so we're straight off to the central african republic <laughs> So now a lot of people get confused about Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Congo. And yeah. we'll, we'll come to a map a little bit later on um, and I'll point that out because it's, they're three countries that literally, they, they sit next to each other, they border on each other. But a lot of people get them confused because I think they just get thrown into this Congo Basin yeah. area. Um, so Central African Republic and yes, the first one is, is Chinko. And, um, so this is in the eastern part of Central African Republic. It's in a region that's been plagued by decades of civil war and insecurity. And it's an absolute unknown wildlife refuge. It's vast, it's 20,000 square kilometers, and it's emerged as a shining light for both biodiversity and governance. Um, in 2014, uh, an NGO called African Parks, and I'm gonna speak a lot about African Parks because they, they have done a lot with a lot of these, these, these parks that we're talking about. Um, you know, African parks took over and signed a 50 year mandate with the government uh, to, to literally manage the park. Prior to this poaching and the natural resource exploitation was rampant. Uh, ethnic violence inflicted upon the civilians was devastating. Uh, but despite this, you know, vast bands of wooded savanna, rainforest have all remained intact. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and with effective law enforcement efforts over the last six years, they've allowed wildlife populations to grow. Um, and this has made, you know, Chinko one of the largest ecosystems with uh, probably the greatest conservation potential in, in all of Central Africa. Um, you know, what, what's even more remarkable is, is what Chinko is doing for the people. And, and I said we're going to cover this a lot with a lot of these parks. Um, you know, in this war-torn corner of the world, Chinko is, is the only stabilizing force in the entire region for the people who live there. There's little to no economic opportunities, uh, but Chinko has remained the largest employer since 2014 when African parks came in. And there are hundreds of people that have found employment year after year. Uh, you know, salaries for school teachers, doctors, nurses have all been provided. Um, and the markets surrounding these areas have emerged to support, <clears throat> excuse me, the staff mm -hmm. at, uh, working at Chinko. And this has just fueled a, a conservation-led economy, which is, is ultimately what, what one's after with a lot of these, these reserves and parks. Um, you know, and for the first time, uh, like sort of recently, 2019, odd, you know, Chinko's value has not just been recognized, but it's, it's actually being lived. Um, local communities, as well as the park's employees, can see their future. And they speak of their children's future, and they're actually speaking of it tomorrow. So, you know, which is something which is, is, for me, that's exciting when you get the communities really talking about these parks benefiting them. So, so Chinko for me is, is, is one to keep on the list. At the moment, there's, there's not, no such tourism ventures into there at the moment. Um, you know, there's ways and means if people want to get in there and, and chat to me about it. But um, yeah, Chinko is an area that uh, there's, no, there's no tourism infrastructure. Um, at the moment, um, up there. So, so there wouldn't be, there would, there's no, there's no sort of at the moment. There's no sort of lodges or anything else like that. Yes. No. So you know, you, you, there are ways to to get, as I said, to to get into these parks, and I'm mentioning them because uh, I have got contacts that that if people are interested, we can we can chat and we can figure out ways to get in there. But this yeah. is not your typical um, African safari destination of you know comfortable lodge game drive vehicles, you know, those, those kind of things. This is, this is where you want to go and, and, and see what a park is doing. And, you know, hopefully maybe even contribute in a way, not just from a, a monetary perspective, but from a, from a, a physical perspective, you know, mm -hmm. there, there could be opportunities there. So um, it's definitely a park to keep on the, on the radar and um, one I'm watching very carefully. And in terms of the wildlife, we've got a picture here of a, a leopard, I think, caught in a, uh, with a with a camera trap, um, which which you sort of said. So, in terms of the wildlife, what 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 kind of wildlife um, is there in Chinko? So you get all your typical rainforest um, Af rainforest uh, elephants. You get leopards on the on the camera traps there. Um, I think if you click through, you got a few few pictures of 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 some of the antelope there. There's some of the forest elephants that are there. Um, 
that's a giant eland, which is, is Africa's largest antelope. It's, it's huge. It's almost just over a ton in weight. Wow. Um, so it's, it's a massive, massive antelope. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you've got sort of all your smaller forest species, dakers. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's more of an adventurous experience of trying to find out what's there. It's got planes game, um, you know, and, and there's just pictures of some of the local markets with some of the, the, the anti-poaching or the ranger patrols that are, are looking after, after Chenko. Um, it's, it's an exciting destination. And as I said, one that definitely needs to be kept on one's radar. I love it. And, and certainly one whereby, you know, if, if, if when it comes to it, people do travel there, they're, again, they're, their presence will have a really positive impact. Uh, because again, like you were saying, that, you know, there, there's, tourism will eventually uh, be a major contributor to the economy and to the communities that are in and be, around. You're right, Jed, you're right. It, it, will, it will be a huge contributor. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that you know, having your feet on the ground in these areas from a, from a tourism perspective and a tour, being a tourist, it, it shows the local population that people want to see these, these areas. They want to look after the wildlife and the forests and the water sources. And, you know, and, and, and if you can show people that, you know, if people are coming from all around the world to see this little area of your home as a local, you know, it, it, it provides a lot of motivation for them to want to keep conserving. Yeah. Um, it, and, genders, you know, it genders that local, that, that sort of local pride in your destiny. Absolutely. Whereas you might have taken it for granted in the past, but then when you realize that so many other people around the world place such huge value on this, like you say, you, you want to look after it, you know. You do. And, um, you know, it's been proven time and time again. You know, if you do not have the, the buy-in of the local communities, a park or a reserve or a protected area is not going to survive. Yeah, very good. Um, on to the next one, Zanga Sanga. Zanga Sanga. <laughs> Zang, yeah, these, these, some of the words are a bit difficult. I even sometimes mix them up a bit. But yeah, Zanga, <laughs> Zanga Sanga National Park, um, once again in the Central African Republic. Um, and this is now nestled into the extreme southwestern corner um, mm -hmm. of the country between Cameroon and the Congo. Um, and it's possibly the most well-known natural attraction in Central African Republic. Um, and it's also one of Africa's best kept secrets in my eyes. You know, the park forms part of what's known as the wider Sanga Tri-National Park, which was established in 1990 and covers an incredible 6,800 miles of virgin rainforest. Yeah. Um, the park is home to an astonishing array of biodiversity with the forest elephant population particularly healthy. Um, as well as presenting a fantastic opportunity to track western lowland gorillas. Um, but, you know, what people really enjoy about these parks are what's known as the byes. There's, there's a bye, basically a forest clearing uh, with marshy depression. Um, and this provides some spectacular wildlife sightings. Now, Zangabai, which it's, the name means the, the village of the elephants, um, is possibly the most famous. Um, and if most people talk about a bai or in the Central African rainforest, this is probably the first one that people will come to and talk about. And, and the pictures will come up of Zanga bai. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a favorite amongst forest animals, and it remains one of the most jaw-dropping sites I think you will ever have the privilege to visit in Africa. Uh, Zanga offers some spectacular wildlife viewing um, and interaction. And, and you can do this all from the, uh, the comfort of a tree lion hide. So you can sort of be hidden on the edges looking into this and just watching hundreds of elephants in the by at any one time. And on the occasion, you get uh, you know, some, some gorillas that come out and also get out there. And, wow. and it's, it's, it's phenomenal just to see all these animals interacting and mixing together. Um, you know, the animals congregate in these areas because of the mineral salts um, and the right. clay from, from the earth. And that's, that's why they, they end up in these areas. Um, and some of these excavations in these byes can be huge. I mean, four meters, five meters in diameter, um, where animals will go and get minerals. Yeah. But just just other animals um, that are found in this area, you can get chimpanzees, uh, sitatungas, which is an antelope, giant forest hogs, red forest hogs, uh, forest buffalo, dakers. Uh, it's an exceptional place for wildlife enthusiasts. And and this is. This is if people, you know, Chinko was if you want to experience the, the raw nature of conservation and a possibly very exciting new venture. Uh, mm -hmm. Zanga is, I think, if you want to go and I don't want to say tick off uh, an animal, but if you want to 
have that opportunity to see more actual wildlife viewing and easier wildlife viewing. Yeah. Um, this is a place that I would definitely sort of look at. And yeah, there are lodges up in, in Zanga. Um, there's the tourism, uh, there's a very small tourism uh, influence into there at the moment, but um, it's still very low. And I think from a, a low season perspective, even in the high season, yeah. Um, it's, it's it's exceptionally low, yeah, yeah. Um, and you're never going to get the crowds. And I hope they don't get the crowds. To be honest with yeah. you, because it's not a place that you do want the crowds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely a place to keep your eye open. A, a good time just to to when to go. I think a lot of people mm. always ask this question, and it's a, it's a difficult one to really answer because it has an equatorial climate. Um, there's no pronounced summer or winter, um, which means that generally there are opportunities for year-round travel. Um, if, if people are looking for specifically the quietest months um, and from a low season traveler point of view, I would look at probably between April, May and June yeah. as being the three quietest months of the year. But yeah, a year round opportunities to travel and um, definitely, definitely on the list. I think people should keep. Wonderful. Where, on that one, where, where do, what's the access point? So you, um, oh, I need to think clearly on that now. I'm just trying to think if you're flying into, you fly into Brazzaville, mm -hmm. um, which is right on the border with the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then from Brazzaville, you take a, um, you can get a flight in and then a, a car drive that goes, takes you in. Nice. Another the, 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 travel, the travel getting into these places can be quite difficult. And if you, yeah. hopefully if you are that adventurous kind of spirit, you, you don't mind it. That's part of the journey. You know, yeah. That's part Absolutely. of the experience is, is the actual traveling into it. But I suppose, you know, yet again, we, I know we say every week, but that this is where, and I think especially this week on a lot of these destinations that we're talking about, um, you know, you, you need to, you need to, you know, really know what you're doing and you need to um, have a good guide and organize Absolutely. it through somebody who knows exactly what they're doing. Absolutely. I, I, I would highly recommend not doing these kind of places on your own. Yeah. Um, a lot of these places you can't do on your own. I'll just put it out there right now is that yeah. it's, 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 you, can't, you can't book direct, you can't get there. Some of them you can, but I would still recommend you, you go with someone that, that does know the area and knows how the logistics work um, and just, yeah, has, has your back yeah. during, the, during the trip. Yeah, super. Um, next one, an AD, Natural and Cultural Reserve in Chad. This one, by the way, Shutterstock did have images. <laughs> I can't. Uh, Aneti, Aneti is, is one of these places that I think is becoming more well known by the minute. Um, yeah. It really is. And it's up in Chad. So we're going to be talking about two places in Chad at the moment. And Aneti is going to be the first one. And then we're going to go down south to Zakuma. Um, but on the map there, just to, so most people see where Chad is and the size of Chad. I mean, just, it gives yeah. you an idea how big Chad is when you put it into a, an, an EU context. Colossal. There. Um, way, way bigger than I imagined. It is colossal. Before. Way bigger than I imagined. It is massive. It's, it's a huge, huge, huge country. And, yeah. and it's a quite interesting. I actually got almost locked down in Chad at the beginning of this pandemic because I was, I was oh, in really? Zakuma and I managed to get the last, I think the second last flight out before they closed their borders. So um yeah my my last little venture before lockdown but um it's a big country and uh it's there's a lot going on and uh and eddie is going to be the first ones we talk about yeah. and um you know it's it's a very very special part of of chad and it's it's once again completely different to what i think most people would would expect so it's in northeastern <clears throat> excuse me northeastern part of chad mm -hmm. it is massive it's fifty thousand square kilometers of these sculptured landscapes with cliffs, natural arches, uh, mushroom rocks, these giant labyrinths and water catchments. Um, and it's been labeled as the Eden in the Sahara. Um, the reserve lies within the Enedi Massif, which is a, a mountainous refuge that was declared by the UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2016 for its very, very unique natural formations and, and globally significant rock art, which dates back over 7,000 years. There's some spectacular rock art there. Mm -hmm. um, today, despite the harsh climate um, and the environment, because it is really harsh there in summer, um, as, as many as 30,000 community members still move through an eddy every single year, and their survival depends on the resources that the reserve provides. Um, so once again, you know, the, the, the management was, was given to, to African parks in partnership with the, the government of Chad. 
um, as, as the landscape had undergone excessive poaching and, and, and unsustainable resource extraction. Mm. Um, but despite this, Jed, you know, the, the flora and fauna that remain are extraordinary. Um, it's become the home to a relic population of desert adapted West African crocodiles. I think you had a picture there um, just before this, this little yeah. fox. There we go. Um, and you know, it's got herds of Barbary sheep uh, and as many as 525 different species of plant um, and at least 180 different bird species that pass through on their migratory routes. So, you know, there is wildlife there and, and there's just, there's a lot. There's the, the diversity there, I think, is amazing. And what, what really pulls people is, is this landscape and these, these rock formations. Um, talking about community, um, there's a very strong community-based conservation pro uh, protection program that ensures that the nomadic tribes that move through that area, um, and they've, these are people that have lived there for thousands of years, that they can continue to live there. Um, and you know, I'm just I'm very excited about Aneti. As I said, it's becoming more and more popular every single day. Um, there is a very small window of opportunity to get in there. Um, and, and through effective management, uh, a very well-run niche tourism, uh, as well as other small enterprises which are being invested in, the potential to preserve this natural and cultural heritage, um, you know, is, it's, it's there and it, it can be done so well. And I'm excited about it, as I said, you know, for, for both the people, for the wildlife, it's, it's definitely one to keep your eye on. Um, and it's, it's a, just, it's a mom, you just can't stop looking at the, at the scenery. You really cannot you can't stop photographing the scenery um so i think brilliant. the pictures you, you've got there are i mean they don't do it justice unfortunately yeah i think it's what it's one of those places that's um you know there's probably no photographs do it justice for when you're there but um i mean it's breathtaking I, you know like i said i was looking at shutterstock um at the at the images there and you know there are there are an awful lot of images but um you get a sense that this this place is just out of this world i mean it's just it, it, it is another it, world you feel like you're out of this world. I mean, there's some of the rock paintings that you can see there. Um, and then, I mean, one of the famous ones for photographers is always taking these 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 nighttime skies and, and the rock formations um, and lighting them up. And there's, I'm sure you saw, there's countless photographs mm -hmm. of, of this. But yeah, not an, not an easy um, not an easy area to get into. Um, you do need to do a small little plane hops here and there. and. Uh, flying into Jamina, which is the capital of Chad, and then getting up to Aneti um, is a plane ride. But it's, it's as I said, that's the adventure. That's 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 the excitement part of getting to these places, and and you do feel like you're in a completely different world when you're up there. Yeah, it almost looked a little bit. Some of the landscape reminded me a little bit of parts of Australia. You know, almost like Western Australia. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've never been, but the picture. Never, you know. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I spoke over you there, Jed. Mm. Um, yeah, I agree. It, it does look like probably parts of, of certain parts of Australia, um, probably even parts of the States. You know, there's yep. certain parts of the States that might have that as well. So, um, yep. absolutely. And and um, and at an AD, do they have, you know, do they have, you know, some form of, you know, lodges or, you know, camps or whatever else? Are they they're sort of, they must be geared up, I guess, in that way now for, for tourism, right? Well, they, they're getting there, but they, they're mobile. So basically you will book a time and there's a camp called Warada Camp, mm -hmm. um, which is, I'm not sure if they're going to, they will be permanent just because it's, it's you know, in the, in the summertime up there, it's just, it's too hot. It's, it's, it's not the kind of time that you want to be up there. Um, so you want to go in, in, and this is Northern Hemisphere. So it's, it's going to be Northern Hemisphere uh, winter that you want to be up there. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, there are a few mobile camps. There's not many. I think there's two, if I stand to be corrected, but I think there's two. Um, and you book them out and you head up there. But it's it's more on a private basis, so uh, you won't necessarily have different people from different areas coming in and, and sharing a camp as you would in most sort of East African or, or Southern African reserves. It's, it's a very different setup that, that works up there. Yeah. Fantastic. That's that's another one that's, uh, that's that's very much on my list. And like I said, I would I would urge anybody out there as well. You know, we, we've we've only got time for it to show a few photographs, um, yeah. but there are an awful lot more. If you do a Google image search on an AD, um, it'll 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 blow you away. There's so many, and they're all incredible and um, very exciting. Yeah, you just you just can't stop looking at some of these photographs. It's, they they are spectacular. Uh, Zakuma National Park. So 
possibly one of one of my favorites but um it's, it's probably a favorite of a lot of of, of guides and, and people that have gone up there and you know this is there's a good reason for you know zakuma has experienced possibly one of the most spectacular transformations in in all of africa um it sits in southwestern chad um, and has a very typical savannah feel uh, it, it's just south of the sahara and it's north of the tropical rainforest so it sits in that sahel region um, you know the national park is part of the greater zakuma ecosystem uh, which is the primary safe haven for for most of central and west african wildlife mm -hmm. uh, but sadly between 2002 and 2010 poachers ransacked the park they decimated the natural resources they stirred fear amongst the local communities um and, and so much so in in, in in that period of time a total of four thousand elephants which is roughly 95 percent of zakuma's population of elephants were slaughtered for their ivory um, and that's just during an eight year period. Um, once again, 2010, uh, the parks trajectory that shifted completely, the Chadian government actually invited African parks to come along and sign a long term agreement um, and to restore and manage Zakuma, um, you know, before they lost it completely. Uh, they overhauled the law enforcement. They provided expert training, creating communication networks and the poaching, plummet the poaching plummeted. Um, you know, and the wildlife started to return. And, and, you know, in the past 10 years, only 24 elephants have been killed. And since 2016, January in 2016, none have been killed. So I'm, I knock my head whenever I say that, touch wood. Um, and it's, it's, that's the positive signs, you know, that's happening out there. In 2011, uh, just to give you an idea, one calf under the age of five was counted. In 2018, 127 calves under the age of five were documented. Um, you know, the elephant population has now surpassed 560 individuals and is on the rise for the first time in decades. So this is, this is really, really exciting. And, um, you know, I was at Zakuma now just before I got locked down and uh, this herd of, of 500 odd elephants used to all stick together, which was pretty spectacular. I mean, if you can just, it was more than pretty spectacular. It was mind blowing. To, to see a herd of over 500 elephants together. And this is different family groups that have come together to create this mega herd. And that was purely from a protection and a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was there now, we were tracking these elephants and they were slowly breaking up into smaller units, which shows more confidence um, in actually being on their own, which is fantastic. You know, and this is a lot of people saying, oh, we're not seeing this, this huge herd of 500. And I'm like, this is even better okay. because you know these these animals are actually getting confidence in themselves and they know that there's a safety here so so that's the exciting side that's going on um you know there's from the community side as well jed um there's there's a huge community engagement uh 17 schools have been built since 2013 um it's offered thousands of children a sustainable education for the very first time in their lives um, and Zakuma once again has become the largest employer in the region. Um, and as I, you know, tourists are, are returning. There are three camps. Um, there's three different, re like sort of, uh, what would I call it? Um, levels of camps, uh, very basic, a sort of a medium and, uh, and a very high end uh, mobile camp. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if, you, if you ever want to experience the, a park that I like to say has literally risen from the ashes to become probably the symbol of hope in Africa, for, for both people and, and wildlife, go to Zakuma because this is truly a spectacular, spectacular story to tell. Um, it's got a very short window of, of opportunity of when, when you can go there. Um, once again, there's two very contrasting seasons in the year. There's the wet season, um, mm -hmm. which they're in at the moment. Uh, it starts between sort of May, June, all the way through to October. And then you have the dry season, which begins sort of around November time towards May, uh, ends in May time. But just to give you an idea, during the wet season, which is now 95% of that park is underwater. Wow. <laughs> so it's, it's wet. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, pretty um, wet. When you're there in the dry season, it's, it's amazing because you look at the trees and you can see the watermark really? on the trees of the previous flood season. Um, and it, it's hard to, to grasp and to get your mind around that. But it's, um, yeah, it's, you know, one very small window of opportunity to when to get there. But um, uh, a park, 
you, you got to go to it's it's i can't wait to get back to that park it it's, really is it's a great that's it's, just that's, it's great, that's one of the main sorry jay go again no, sorry it's a, it's a great success story isn't it i mean the you know for for the for the work that's been done i mean that's this is conservation and tourism hand in hand and it's what it looks like when it's successful and it's um it seems like it's a it's a shining example for for other similar parks actually um around africa absolutely it is it is the shining example it really is it's um it's just done so much if you go back one one slide Jade, yeah. sorry yeah. um that's that's the the main camp area of camp nomad so that's the more upended uh, in market camp um and that that camp you take out privately so typically a um, a specialist guide or private guide that will go in there with with their clients so you you book out um, a week literally you arrive there on on uh I think it was a Wednesday to a Wednesday, if I remember correctly. Um, and you spend a week there and you go and explore. And a lot of people go, isn't a week too long? No, you don't cover a smidgen of that park. But there's just so much stuff to do. And, you know, it's with a lot of these parks where tourism happens. There is so much to do. Um, and it's not the tur your typical tourism safari-based East Africa or Southern Africa kind of safari. It's, it really is something very, very special. Um, so, yeah, the bird life there is incredible. Um, I think you've got a few more pictures there. There's an elephant. That dust haze, actually, sorry, if you look there at that photograph, that dust haze is actually the, the Hamatan winds that are blowing down from the Sahara that at the time when I was there which was getting it, making it quite dusty, but that's part of the atmosphere. It's, it's really spectacular. Yeah. I love that shot. I'll probably need to make that slightly larger. So, um, yeah, this is, this is very interesting, actually. Can you make out what that is? I, I was really struggling at first because at first I was thinking, what what exactly is that? It looks, I'm seeing the, I'm seeing lions around there. I can think I can see, um, yeah, I can see probably a, maybe about five lions, six lions. Is it? I don't know what they're surrounding. So yeah, there's that's a pride of lions, and this is just quite fortuitous, and that's what I love about this park because it's wild. It really is wild. And we, I was in a in a very small Cessna Tour Six sort of uh, anti poaching spotter plane that we were just doing the rounds, and mm. um, we've flew over this and this was a pride of lions that were trying to hunt that buffalo um i think they eventually gave up because we we didn't want to scare them too much so we, we backed off quite a bit and by the time we moved the lion the buffalo had moved off and the lions had sort of just like now we're going to lie down now and have a sleep but yeah i mean this is just what goes on there you know it's it's incredible it's it's the wildlife viewing the uh, the bird life, the uh, just everything, the tribe, spending time with the nomadic people um, is is something really special as well. Um, I think you've got a few photographs there of myself yeah. with them. Um, you know, just spending time with them and just go and sit with them when you have an interpreter and they are so hospitable. It is unreal. I mean, we got there, we sat on the floor, we took our shoes off, which we have to do when we go into their homes and this is their home. Yeah. And they give you this bowl of of very sugary, sweet water which is is it looks very brackish dirty water but you know you drink it and you almost feel like well if you get sick you get sick but you know what i'm not going to miss out on this experience because this yeah. is just something really it's a privilege um and did so, you get yeah that no <laughs> <laughs> okay you know, for, fortunately i didn't but no it's mm. just it's you know this is part of the experience and and this is what it's all about and um this was a the relationship between Zakuma and so the park and the, and the nomads just saying guys you know this is the border of the park we don't want you pushing yourself too far and um you know we'll help you you help us let's let's just work together and yeah as i said very hospitable um and definitely and this is with all these parks that i'm talking about you know is, is people need to spend time with the people yeah absolutely. so just bird life i mean just that's i mean the pelicans the that's a aquilia memoration that's on the bottom left there um that's incredible. incredible. I mean, you yeah. get billions of these quillia that come in clockwork every morning. They fly over you. They come and drink at the, at the, at the water there, and then they fly off east to their, their um, foraging grounds. And then every evening they'll fly back and do the same thing before they go and roost. And, you know, people say, oh, but I'm not interested in birds. <laughs> I don't care. This will make you interested in birds. Yeah. You'd be <laughs> hypnotized really cool. by it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. I love that. And that's uh, some and of these, the these are the, the anti poaching patrols, and you know, spending t these these men I respect so much because they are out there. And I mean, when we were there, 
I was there in, in end of, of, of March, um, no, beginning of March time, middle of March, actually, just around there. I mean, we're sitting with 45, 48 degree temperature, uh, centigrade. Um, you know, it's hot, it's humid, it's stifling. And these, these gentlemen are out all day on horseback patrolling. Um, I take my hat off to them, I really do. And they spend weeks out, you know, they, they cover the entire park. Um, it's just, and, it, and spending time with them is what's something I would, I would highly recommend for anyone to go and do is just go spend some time with them. Yeah, and it's uh, obviously it's such such dangerous work that they do as well. Um, it is, but you know they've they've formed such a good relationship with the surrounding communities that yeah. they have a radio system that if any suspicious person comes in or starts asking questions about things, there's in, there's there's informants in 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 these villages that will mm -hmm. radio the patrols and say, hey, listen, you need to come out here, and or this is happening, or so and so is going on, and you know the reaction on that is so quick that um yeah they've they've just done so well and uh you know just the the stats of the poaching that's come down the elephants that are, are, are getting older and you know the, the population numbers that are increasing it's just it's, it's it's such a success story yeah superb on then to garamba national park democratic republic of congo so garamba national park is, is probably just to let everybody know, I, I, I kind of got mixed up with the maps before, so I'm, I'm hoping I've got it right now, Warren, <laughs> uh, because I, I will admit I, I sometimes get confused with the different uh, Congos and Central African Republic, etc. So uh, hopefully I've got this one right. So you, a lot of people get confused, Jay, don't worry. It's, um, yeah, it can be very confusing. But, but the Democratic Republic of Congo, I mean, it's a huge country. And, um, you know, Garamba National Park, a lot of people will, will ask me, but why do you mention Garamba? Why do you want to talk about Garamba? Because it's such a dangerous place. And this really? is, I just want people to understand that this is a park that, yeah, right now, it's, 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 it's becoming a lot more stable. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's had a very, very bad um, reputation in the past. But going forward, and I think this is what we, we're looking at, at future frontiers, the new frontiers of, of possible areas to look into. Um, to me, Garamba, and I hope to me, you know, Garamba is one of them. I really do. Um, you know, it's a World Heritage Site. Um, it's, it's one of Africa's oldest national parks, uh, as well as being the very last stronghold for the largest population of elephants and, and the last remaining Kordofan giraffe in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, you know, Garamba, it's situated, uh, I think you had a map there in the northeastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, borders with South Sudan. Um, but sadly, you know, this critically important landscape has had a tragic, tragic past and is often referred to as ground zero in the elephant poaching wars in Africa. Really? Um, it was once home to 22,000 odd elephants, if I remember correctly, um, as recently as the 1970s. But shockingly, you know, poachers came in, they were militarized poachers, literally, that they, they'd reduced the population to fewer than 1,200 that are today. Um, and the northern white rhino were poached to local extinction in the early 2000s. Um, you know, but these, these poachers, they were so highly incentivized, um, and they were made up of South, primarily South Sudanese armed groups, uh, one which a lot of people might have heard of being the Lord Resistance Army, the LRA, um, and others that literally targeted the, the region's elephants for the sale of the ivory to, to fund the criminal activities. So there's been a lot of negative publicity on Garamba, um, but I like to try and look forward and I try and look at, at, at the positives that can come out of this. Um, once again, African Park signed an agreement in 2005 to, to manage Garamba, um, along with the ICCN. You know, this resulted in the implementation of an extensive law enforcement strategy uh, with massive support from, from external donors. Uh, it, the professionalism, um, along with the increased security measures was, that was afforded to the rangers, uh, you know, the, the, the population has, I mean, sorry, the poaching has just completely almost been eliminated. Um, yeah. you know, since implementation, there's been a significant reduction in, in, in actual legal activity inside the park. Mm -hmm. uh, elephant poaching, it's dropped by roughly 90%. Um, and I mean, I, I hate to even say this, but you know, not even one ranger has been killed and knocking my head again 
um, killed in action by arm poachers since 2017. So, you know, you're going a, a few years with, with none of the rangers losing their lives. And it's, as I said, this is to me, I always feel like an investment sort of I'm, I'm betting on, on stocks here, like what's going to be better in the, in the long run. But to me, this is a place that's, that's going to be, I reckon, a place to go and visit and see. And it's going to need support. Um, you know, it's, it's going to need tourism. So, um, you know, for me, it's, it's a fantastic place. You know, wildlife populations are, are stabilizing and they're increasing which is exciting and and that's what's what you you want you know but especially you know when you were sort of saying that this was sort of ground zero from the the sort of the poaching side of things um mm. obviously the, there's been a you know again a tremendous amount of work that's been done over recent years to reverse that uh, with quite some degrees of success but some of the numbers you're talking about from the um uh from the you know from the poaching perspective is is absolutely frightening isn't it um, it's very scary it's scale really of it is, is. We, you know we just can't we hear about poaching and we, you know we, it's very hard to get a handle on the scale of it when you're saying you know the, the white rhinos you know basically po poach to um to local extinction um mm -hmm. I mean, it's just frightening and the numbers of elephants uh, being poached and, and kills just yeah staggering actually yeah I and mean, there is there's so much good work going into it and i think that's why you know for me a lot of people will ask about you know contributing and how can they help out with with conservation in africa and um you know they want to support and they want to help and they want to do and my first answer to them is you know save up your money instead of putting it in um to actually going to visit these places and when yeah. you there on the ground then have a look a little bit further into it of okay is there something specific you want to look at and um contribute and help to and if 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 you don't want to travel to these areas then you know there are specific um ngos and and organizations that are out there that that are really doing such phenomenal work um, <clears throat> excuse me that you know it's it's if it weren't for these these organizations you know i, I reckon half of these places that i'm talking about would not be around yeah it's it's true you, you, and um you you spoke very eloquently about, about this on the um we did a special podcast for World Tourism Day, which we released um, yesterday. Um, but again, if anybody out there hasn't listened to it, would um, you should really give it a listen. We we spoke to Warren and we spoke to Chris Flynn from the World Tourism <coughs> of Culture and Heritage. Um, but but one of the things which really came across, uh, and you brought up that point, uh, Warren, again, which was, you know, if you rather than donate money, save up and actually travel there. And then your money is going directly into those communities. And also, I was sort of thinking, um, when, I, when I was listening to you on that podcast, was also, you know, when we travel, we become ambassadors for those destinations. We build that, that connection with the local community, with the wildlife, etc. But then we come back, and especially these days, we're on social media telling everybody about our travels. We're posting the pictures and everything else. We can actually reach out to hundreds of people that are in our social circles. And we then become ambassadors for these destinations like Garamba. And that's helping them by hopefully encouraging other people to think, well, actually, yeah, maybe we should go there and give it a go. And that's, that's, how, you know, that's how tourism should work, hopefully. Exactly, Jed. It really is. And... Uh... You know, when, when these people on the ground that are, are being told, you know, we got to look after this because we want to preserve it. You know, it's not just for tourism is a small part of it. You know, we want to pr pr protect these areas, obviously for wildlife, but also for the people that are living in these and around these areas. You know, it's, it's you know, you protect these areas in the in the Congo Basin that, you know, provides you know, millions of people with fresh water and if you start deforesting and, and doing all the necessary stuff where you're not looking after these these wellness areas you're actually harming yourself as a human being at the end of the day and i think i think you know this pandemic hopefully has shown a lot of people that we need to look after our environments a lot more and um as i said uh, i think i said to kate you know this is um on the podcast yesterday or the, the on friday actually this is a blessing in disguise i, I say this this whole pandemic it really is and i, I really hope that you know this the traveler that now travels not just to africa but anywhere around the world is is looking at it in a completely different viewpoint yeah. um so okay. yeah it's it's i'm excited about the you know the future and going forward in, in tourism and travel yeah me too me too um odds Od 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 <laughs> 
I just, I, you can just say Odzala. <laughs> Odzala, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that works. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, so Odzala is Odzala Kakaya is yeah for me this is a it's a nirvana for for nature lovers it really is it's it's situated in the heart of of the second largest tropical rainforest in the world um and it harbors the critically endangered western lowland gorilla and that's probably the biggest draw card to to Odzala or the gorillas yeah. um you know the, there's forest elephants as well but there's a huge amount of bird species i think there's 400 odd 450 odd different bird species in in Odzala. Um, but as I say, you know, it, it lies in the heart of the Congo Basin, um, and this Congo Basin, just to put into perspective, it, it, it spans an area of two million square kilometers across six countries, and accounts for about eighteen percent of the world's remaining rainforest. Wow! For over fifty, sorry, for over fifty thousand years, I think. Yeah, I'm getting my numbers correct now. For over fifty thousand years, humans have habituated the area. Um, yet it's still the most biologically diverse and species-rich area on the planet. Um, it delivers clean water, just what I was mentioning earlier, to, to you know, uh, roughly, I think, 70-odd, 75 million people in that area. Um, you know, that map, if you look on the, the left-hand map there, if you can bring it just larger, that just gives you an idea. And I'm just talking about a very small area there. You can see Odzala... Um, number one there in red, uh, Zanga, Zanga, which we spoke about earlier, is number two up top there. But just that, that whole area, now we're covering a very small fraction of, of sort of these, these, these reserves. I mean, Gabon, I haven't even touched on yet. In Gabon, there's a few uh, sort of reserves that are coming out there and, and sort of really going to be a name for themselves in the future. And definitely this whole area for me is something that people need to, to, to keep an eye on. Um, but you know, for the, for Adzola, um, you know, the future it, it's, it sits balanced on on the, the urgent need to unlock the park's value to the communities who live in and around the park. Um, they are the main stakeholders, um, and it's their actions that will determine if this park persists or not. Uh, you know, changing the human behavior takes time, but you know, Azola's future rests on the ensuring that the communities benefit from and, and therefore truly value the park's existence. So mm -hmm. tourism for me, it's it's the one and only way to do this. You know, get people in there, and there are lodges. There's a, a few lodges that are up there, and, and you know, you'll see some of the the pictures there that uh, you can flick through. It's just a scenically stunning, stunning, stunning place, and uh, very different. So a lot of activities. There's forest elephants. Uh, you know, the um, Western Lowland gorillas. It's um, a lot of activities you do on foot. You do on canoes. Um, once again, the, the anti-poaching and the ranger patrols are, are phenomenal. These, these men are just brilliant. Um, and, and spend time with the, with the local communities because, uh, you know, it's, it, it just en enhances your, your visit there. It really does. Um, yeah. You know, once again, when we talk about seasons and when to go there, uh, like the before, wet season, dry season, um, once again, it, you know, it lies on the, on the equator. So the temperatures will, will differ very little. There's two rainy seasons. Um, the wet season is March uh, to May, and then again from September to November. And then the dry season is from December to February, and then from June to September. That's right. So dry season, December to February, uh, June to September. So, um, you know, it's, it's dry season is probably the, the time most people will want to go there. Um, there's a few more advantages to it. Um, the root, the, the 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 fruits of a lot of the the, the trees they they ripen. Uh, the gorillas often feed on these fruits, which makes the, the sightings a lot easier. Which obviously for people that's what they want, an easier way. Um, but just it's an, it's also a better way to 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 observe the behaviour of and, and the interactions of these animals. So, but to me, you know, um, pick and choose a time. It's 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 all year travel time um if you don't mind getting wet in the wet season and getting through a lot of mud and water and to me that's the adventure yeah. it's, a, it's a fantastic time um but yeah definitely another park of mine to to keep on the on the list i, I mean first of all you know, who, who doesn't mind getting a little bit muddy i mean you know if you if you, if you <laughs> genuinely if you if you're going on a safari you know what, what do you what do you want it to be like you know completely sanitized i mean that's 
that's all part. I would be disappointed if I didn't get covered in mud, frankly. But well, it's, it's, as you say, it's a free mud pack that you get on, on yeah, the bar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. People pay good <laughs> money for that one, so um, exactly. no issue with that. Um, in terms of um, safety, you know, not just for this one, but for all of these, um, but you know, when we talk about um, about this one, how how safe is it? Um, you know, again, obviously, let, let's go on the assumption that we're going with experts um, and guides, and we, you know, we're we're, we're doing this the smart way. Um, how safe is it? If you're specifically talking about Azala, um, yeah. then yeah, it's safe. Yeah, it is safe to go to. Yeah, good. Um, on to the next one. I own a national park. Now, I think Iona is one that, that you're really going to enjoy. Just going back to our, our talk on Namibia um, yeah. a few weeks ago. I can't remember yeah. how long ago it was. Yeah. Um, but this, this is an exciting new park. Now, just to, to state up front, there's, there's no tourism infrastructure here whatsoever at the moment. Um, but down the line, um, there's going to be. It's, 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 there's, there's just so much potential for this park. Um, so Iona National Park is, is one of the largest parks in Angola. Um, it has many species of reptiles, plants, birds that occur only in this eco-region. Um, mm -hmm. It's situated in the very southwestern corner of Angola, and it constitutes the northern tip of the Namib Desert, which is, we've spoken about, the oldest desert in the world. Um, it's contiguous, actually, with the Skeleton Coast National Park in Namibia, yeah. which is also contiguous with the Namib Naukluf National Park in Namibia. Um, and this creates one of the largest trans-frontier conservation areas in the world. Uh, combined, it covers nearly 50,000 square kilometers, um, of which Iona is 15,000 of that. So yeah. just to give you a bit of a, a size perspective, it's, it's huge, it's big. The, the trans-frontier uh, area is incredible. Um, of what's being protected and what's sort of been included now, which is really exciting. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people have never heard of Iona before. You know, even most people that work and live in Africa have probably never heard of Iona. Mm. Um, the, re the reserve was actually proclaimed in 1937, uh, quite a few years back. Um, but unfortunately, when Angola went through that, that devastating civil war, it greatly dis disrupted the whole area, you know, poaching, uh, infrastructure all got destroyed. Um, you know, it, it was one of probably one of the richest parks in the region, and in in a few years got completely decimated. Um, you know, historically the park was inhabited by rhino and elephant. Um, both of these species have become locally extinct, uh, but there are plans, I believe, to to reintroduce uh, some of these local species back again, which is which is exciting. Um, so, you know, Iona, it, it, it encompasses a, a variety of, of distinct landscapes. And I think this is what makes it really, really exciting. It goes from the sand dunes that run along the Atlantic Ocean, ocean the coastline. And that's about 160 kilometers of, of coastline that, that Iona, Iona is, is part of. It goes to the mountainous peaks reaching as high as 1,500 meters in the east. And in, in the center, it has these expansive sandy plains. Um, you know, numerous springs run through the area from the mountains, which provide water throughout to, to many animals within the park. Um, you know, and the, the average rainfall can, can vary. It goes from 20 to 100 millimeters per year, depending on, on what part of the, the park you're in. Um, and most of that rain falls between February and April. So, you know, despite the, the extreme aridity, um, the place still holds a, a huge amount of biodiversity. Many of the plant species found on the dunes uh, near the coast, they rely on the dense fog that comes in from the, from the Atlantic Ocean, um, you know, as well as probably one of the most well-known sort of ancient plants, which is the Wellwitchia mirabilis. Um, you know, it's, it's a commonly referred to as a living fossil. And, and this plant can only be found in this contiguous, contiguous protected area. Cool. Um, reptiles are probably the most well-adapted to this kind of environment. Um, and there's, I think there's a at least eight that are endemic to the area, if I remember correctly. Um, but mammal species, everyone wants to know about mammal species, um, have healthy populations of zebra, oryx, uh, springbok, there's cheetah, leopards that have been seen, there's brown ahina. Mm. Um, but let's now also move into the ocean because the marine biodiversity is, is, is massively rich. You know, this is an area that 
it's it's the far northern reaches of the cold Benguela current, which is is very productive, um, mm. and it actually it's it's in an area where the warm Angola front meet. So you have this this mix of of warm and cold currents, and it, it's it's a fantastic place for for fish stocks for the recovery of fish stocks, um, and I think there are they have definitely plans to to expand the park into a, a marine ecosystem in the future. So so this is is exciting from that perspective as well. Um, you know, so it's 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 a park that I just always like to. It's a new park that's come out about recent. It's been about for a long time, but uh, once again, it's, it's it's sort of popping its head out now. And I just think that uh, I can't wait to get into this park and go and explore it and and go and and, and have a look. It's a park I haven't been to yet. Yeah. Um, I have a, a colleague that that is the the ops manager, or um, I think he might be. I'm not sure. He went for an interview, but um, he's gone to go and have a look. But I'm just excited about uh, what this park has to offer. It's, it seems like it seems you know again when I was looking at the images um it does seem in in many ways yeah very similar to when we were talking about Namibia um obviously in this, this sort of skeleton coast there but again the, the diversity of the landscapes was just absolutely phenomenal I had to keep double checking on the images to make sure you know I was, I was getting I was getting it right because you know one yeah. minute you're talking about these huge ocean expanses, um, along the skeleton coast, which is just breathtaking, um, really. And then the next thing, there's these, you know, incredible, um, you know, mountainous kind of areas and rock areas. And then you, you know, you seem to have these vast sort of plains. And it's, wow, it's just, it's got everything, absolutely everything. Is, yeah, is it? I, is it? You know, you were sort of saying it that it, obviously it's it's sort of quite old. Um, it, has it got? any form of infrastructure at the moment or is it really at the very beginning it, it's from a tourism perspective yeah. there's, no, there's no infrastructure no. um the the infrastructure is is primarily from a management of the park perspective um, yep. but there there is definitely um it's on the horizon that uh, you know infrastructure is needed they, they they definitely i know that tourism is is definitely one of the avenues that they want to get back into this area as you said the diversity of this park is is incredible um you know and i think that just leads to a better tourist offering at the end of the day you know you're not going to one area with one sort of ecosystem that's just going to be the same throughout your entire stay so mm. it's it's something that um yeah it's it, i don't know when on the cards it's going to happen um but i'm going to keep my ear to the ground uh i'm going to speak to the people that that are, are running the park and looking after the park and, and making sure that uh as soon as possible, we can get uh, yeah. tourists or tourist infrastructure in there. You know, there there are talks about the the future reintroductions of elephants, rhino, lion. So there's a lot of exciting things that that's going to be happening here. Awesome. We'll have to keep an eye on that one for sure. Um, and our last one for today, um, Panjari National Park in in Benin. And I've got to point out at this juncture, I've actually been to Benin. Oh, brilliant! I have actually been to Benin. Admittedly, I was about seven years of age at the time, um, but I was there in Cotonou and Lake Gambier um, and, a, and a few places around there. But I, I've, obviously, I've never been to Penjari and I haven't been as an adult, so uh, I, don't, I don't really count it. But tell us a little bit about Penjari. So, I mean, I think we've gone from from one complete sort of part of Africa to, to the other here. Um, so into West Africa, and, and you know, Pinjari is the conservation stronghold for West Africa, um, plain and simple. Um, it, it forms a, a very critical, important triad of national parks, uh, where roughly ninety percent of the West African lion population remains. Um, you know, mm -hmm. not many people once again have heard of Pinjari. Um, its primary component, uh, Pinjari, is the primary component of a, of a massive. 32,000 square kilometer transnational complex, which spans Benin, Burkina mm -hmm. Faso, and Niger. Um, and is the, it's the largest intact wild ecosystem in West Africa. Um, I don't think most people, when you talk about West Africa, think from a safari perspective, but um, mm -hmm. this is, is as close to, a, you'd probably get to, to an East African, Southern African kind of experience. Um, it's the it's the last refuge of roughly I think just over a thousand five hundred elephants, um, twenty five percent of the remaining uh, four hundred critically endangered West African lions occur here. 
but you know, once again, years of, of poaching and, and unsustainable use have threatened the landscape. So, um, you know, this is, has also taken a bit of time to, to get off the ground. Uh, 2018, an extraordinary lifeline was given to, to this area. Um, the Benin government with the, the Weiss Foundation, National Geographic, the Wildcat Foundation and African Parks announced a, a 23 million US dollar commitment over 10 years um, that was pledged to protect